the first time buyers webinar. Welcome uh, in. Welcome, welcome. So today's special edition, we're going to go through the whole buying process from beginning to end. That way, when it's time for you to buy your next home, you're super educated and you're, you have all the information needed. Uh, once again, I'm Rich Jackson, a local real estate agent. I'm here accompanied by my partner in crime, uh, Mark Rocha. He's a loan officer with Nexa Mortgage. How you doing, Mark? Good, man. Good. Yeah. How are you? Good, man. Good. Did you man. get this information out? Oh, yeah. We got a lot of great information for you guys today. So I would just say uh, sit back, sit tight, and be ready for a bunch of um, jam-packed information on the buying process. All right. Well, let's jump into it, guys. So, you know, I get a lot of people calling me and, you know, people that are, um, you know, not too familiar with the pro process. And a lot of times people think, you know, the first step is to actually go out, just look at a bunch of houses, you know, mm -hmm. which is cool. You know, that's you the fun part. that is the fun part. And you got to have an idea of uh, what you want, you know, what's going to be the best home for your family and the best fit. But however, um, truth be told, the very truthful fact of buying a home, the first, first step is meeting with a loan officer, such as Mark Rocha, someone like that. I'll tell you why that is the first step and the importance. The reason you want to go ahead and uh, sit down with a loan officer, even when the thought is in your head that you may be interested in buying, is because, for one, you're not able to make an offer on a house once you do find that perfect house without the pre-approval. So say you go out looking at a bunch of homes and then you, you know, you and your family, you like, you fall in love with the house. It's the perfect home. It's beautiful. Now you're not being, you're not pre-approved yet. So now it's a rush to go meet with the loan officer, uh, go through the whole pre-approval process. And nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, um, the house is no longer available once you get approved because that process can take several days or a week, you know, to get pre-approved. So for one, you wouldn't be in a position to make an offer. And even just as importantly, you could, we could be out or you could be out looking at a bunch of houses outside of your price range or even maybe too low. So say you're out looking at a bunch of houses, you're going around looking at about 10, 15 houses, you find one just to realize once you get qualified that you know, you qualify for less than the houses that you were looking at or vice versa. You know, you might be looking at homes, you know, thinking you want to stay around, say, 250000 and those are the houses you're looking at. Then you get pre-qualified and realize, wow, I can actually afford a $400,000 house. Um, and so now all that time was wasted before looking at the lower. So it's always good to be prepared uh, and just, just in case that time you do find the home you love. So that's the real reason of meeting with a loan officer. And Mark, a lot of times there's things that people may um, they may not be aware of. Maybe they need help with credit, right? Um, maybe uh, the income is not as uh, much as they need to, you know, they need to make more income. Maybe their debt is too high. But all those factors are great to know early on, because if you get ahead of them, you can start now with your loan officer, make a great plan, and then they'll walk you through the steps to where maybe two or three months down the line, you can qualify for your desired amount. Yeah, that's 100% correct. I mean, you don't go to uh, the grocery store unaware of your budget, you know, just uh, picking well, items and, do, huh? and hoping and hoping that the, the card works. You know, you don't you don't hit the car lot without knowing exactly how much you can buy. Very true. You know, you're going to start looking at all the Hellcats and realize, you know, you're getting a Honda Civics and that's the most yeah. you can get. So you don't do that for those situations. You don't want to do it for home shopping as well. Absolutely. All right. So when we are looking and talking about a mortgage pre-approval, what we're talking about is getting you qualified to purchase a home. And if you are qualified, finding out just how much you're qualified for. Now, the main components of a mortgage pre-approval -pre consist of a mortgage application to whatever bank, mortgage broker, uh, independent mortgage consultant, whoever you're using, whoever it is you're using, it is a mortgage application to that person. Now, this mortgage application is going to be pretty standard uh, name, social security number, date of birth for anybody that's going to be on the loan. Okay, you're going to fill this out like like any application for a, a credit card. You know, there's a lot of it is basic information. Um, the parts that are more pertaining to the mortgage in the application is things like your income, uh, any liabilities that you have that you want to list out. Um, not that the application is going to be the end all be all because there will be a credit report pulled as well, which will also tell us more, but just starting with that mortgage application, pretty standard information that's going to be part of the mortgage pre-approval process. The other thing that, which I just alluded to was a credit pull on the credit, on the credit report 
which is going to come after the application, because in the application, we're going to get things like uh, your name, your current residence, past residence, uh, your social security number, date of birth. We're going to use all of this to pull a credit report and pair it with your mortgage application that you put in. Once we have the, the application, we got all your personal information. We have the personal information to pull the credit report. Once we have the credit report, we know what your score is and we know what liabilities and debts you have in your guys' name. The other thing, the third part, okay, we got the mortgage application, credit report. The last thing is the financial documents. Financial documents are going to consist of, now this is standard, uh, but everybody's situation is a little bit different. Uh, but standard is going to be the past two years of tax returns or W-2s, depending on whether you're a W-2 employee or you're self-employed. Uh, so tax returns are W-2s past two years. Uh, two is an important number when it comes to these documents. So past two years of tax returns are W-2s, past two months of bank statements, past 30 days, majority of the time it's two paychecks because most people are paid biweekly. But if you're paid weekly, then we're looking for four. We're looking for the past 30 days of pay stubs and a California ID or driver's license for everybody that's going to be on the loan. So just to recap, when you meet with a lender, you are putting in a mortgage application, you are authorizing a credit pool, and you are supplying financial documents in order to gain a mortgage pre-approval. Once we have all of these documents in, a loan officer or a bank, whoever you're going to, will be able to then pull the file. They may even tell you that, okay, hey, everything's in, Mr. Loan Officer, Mrs. Loan Officer, what's the next step? We're going to pull your file and run the application. So when we do that, we're going to look at different areas of your financial background and determine if you are qualified through these different areas of, of your background, we'll then be able to decide if you are qualified, how much you're qualified for. So that's this, that's the mortgage pre-approval process. That's what goes into it. Now, when we're actually pulling the file, okay, you've, you've delivered everything that I asked for. Okay. I've got the mortgage application. I've got the credit report that, that you authorized me to pull. And I've got all the financial documents. Once I pull that, Mark is going to look at four different things. This is a golf analogy for any golf fans out there <laughs> or, or wives that their husbands are always golfing. Ask them what a caddy is. Okay. There's a, a professional golfer will never hit the course without their caddy. Mm. Their caddy is their assistant, helps them, you know, pick out all the clubs they need for the course. Sure. Through the mortgage, when when we pull the file, caddy, just remember caddy. That's okay. your support. That's your help. C-A-D-I. Spelled a li little bit different for golf, okay. but for mortgage, C-A-D-I. C, credit, credit score. A, assets. D, debt. I, income. Okay. So when I pull the file, I'm looking at those four areas, credit, assets, debt, and income. Okay. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at credit, depending on what kind of loan we're going to use. And, um, and, and these are all conversations that you'll have with the loan officer. Everybody's financial position and background is different. Um, some people will, will be a perfect fit for a conventional loan. Mm -hmm. um, some people are veterans and VA is going to be the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the four different areas, uh, four different loan products that most first-time home buyers are going to get, it's going to be an FHA loan, conventional loan, VA loan, or USDA loan. Each one of these has different credit score requirements. So to, to bog you down right now with all of that would be overwhelming. But just know that credit is what we look at to determine what product is going to work best for you. Okay. So really quickly, FHA, we want a minimum of 580. VA, we want a minimum of 500. These are credit scores. Conventional, we want a minimum of 640. USDA, we want a minimum of 640. Now, each of these were minimums to qualify. We don't want bare minimum, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the higher you go with your interest rate, the lower your interest rate will be. I'm sorry, the higher you go with your credit score, the lower your interest rate will be from the bank, okay? You're going to be deemed less risky with a higher interest rate, which means that they're going to give you a cheaper cost on your money, meaning a lower interest rate. If we have a lower interest rate, we now have a lower monthly payment. Everybody wants a lower monthly payment, so let's not sure. aim for the minimum. Okay, let's not aim for those credit score minimums that I just stated. Let's instead go as high as we possibly can. But just so you guys know, those are that's what we're looking for. Okay. Um, now, when we when we pull, still sticking on credit here, the C of caddy. When we pull a credit report, something that a loan officer may or may not talk to you about 
uh, just depending on what pops up on your report, um, are derogatory items, meaning anything that you've been laid on, collections, default, things like that will pop up and can potentially disqualify you. Not automatic de disqualifications, but can potentially. Um, so that's something that a loan officer would talk to you about. Credit card utilization rates. What will also pop up is any credit cards that you have open in your name is going to show the max limit on that card, and it's going to show whatever the report is is reporting as your balance. Okay, mm -hmm. now we're going to look at that number, and if you're if that card allows you six grand in credit, and we're sitting at five thousand dollar balance, okay, that is a large portion of that card being used. There's not there's more there's more balance on it than there is room for you to charge more. That is not a good thing for your credit report. That's mm -hmm. not a good thing for your credit score. Okay. So these are areas that we're going to look at to fulfill that C of caddy, that credit portion. All right. Moving on to a assets. Assets are going to, are what we look at when we're determining whether or not you're going to have enough funds to close the deal. Okay. So there's a lot of different things that uh, a lot of different programs that will cover down payment assistance uh, that will cover closing costs, but we're going to assume that none of that is happening. We want to we want to evaluate this file as if you are coming into the fold with your own skin in the game, meaning that you are putting your portion of the down payment and then financing the rest. That is ultimately what you're doing when you purchase a home. You are giving them three and a half percent down, five percent down, whatever percent uh, for whatever loan product we're using. And again, that is a conversation you'll have with your loan officer because that's going to be different with everybody. But we're going to assume you're coming with a minimum and financing the rest. Okay. So when we're looking at assets, which is the A of caddy, that's the second part. We're looking at, do they have the funds for the down payment? Do they have the funds for closing costs? Now, something that's often overlooked with assets uh, or, or not known is that you can pull assets from multiple areas. It doesn't necessarily need to come savings account, checking account. Um, what, what often happens, especially lately is um, you, there are people that have been with their employer for a long time, uh, people that have been investing in stocks. Um, so you can pull these assets from a retirement account or a 401k or a Roth IRA um, if you have any of these. If you have a Robinhood account um, or an Acorns account or a Fidelity, anything that you're using to, to buy and trade stocks, if you have a certain amount in there and you want to sell out and pull, all of that, you can do that as well. So that can count towards your assets as well. Um, as long as it's from a reliable source, it can also come in the form of a gift. Uh, you know, and, and the reliable source, again, changes per loan product. So if we're sitting and we're looking at doing an FHA, then you know certain people are allowed to help you with a gift. If we're looking and we're doing conventional, VA, USDA, all of them have different reliable sources for gifts. So again, a conversation that you need to have with a loan officer. Mm. Okay. Assets is typically the biggest hurdle for a first time home buyer. That's a lot of money to save up. You know, we're talking about three and a half percent down. So for every hundred thousand dollars you're borrowing, thirty five hundred. And that's just the down payment portion. So if we're looking at a three hundred thousand dollar house, we're looking at ten thousand five hundred, just the down payment portion. Closing cost is going to consist of a couple different areas, which may add up to another two, two and a half percent of the purchase price. So could get very expensive very quickly, and it's typically the biggest hurdle for first-time home buyers. So, mm. uh, but that that is again just one area that we look at. Okay, moving on from assets to the next one, debt. Okay, the D in caddy, C A D debt. Uh, what we're looking for here is everything that pops in on your credit report. They're going to give us all sorts of things that you have had active in your history, that you've closed out in your history that you've missed payments on in your in your credit history. All of this is going to be laid out. What we're looking at is the active ones, okay? Mm -hmm. The active loans that are open and they could be installment like uh like term loans, uh, like an auto loan or or maybe you you uh finance some furniture, you know, over and then you have to pay it off over the next 2 years. A lot of that stuff will pop up on your credit report as as installment loans. We'll also the what will also be popping up is revolving credit lines, those are like your credit cards. Yeah. Uh, mortgage liabilities, if you already have a home and you're thinking about making it a rental or if you're going to sell it and buy a new one, just there's a lot of different things that pop up on the credit report. What we're looking at here for debts is what is open, what still has an open balance, and what is that monthly payment? Okay, It's very important that we find out what those monthly minimum payments are 
because that's going to help us factor what's called a DTI. Now, before we even go and try to get a mortgage, okay, because these obligations are already in place. And unless, unless you plan on selling your auto or paying one of these things off before buying, we're going to roll with you having these debts as you move into a home, okay? So these debts are going to be on top of this new potential mortgage you're about to take, okay? When we look at these, we compare it to the I, which is the income, the last letter of caddy, okay? Income, we're looking for two years of current work history um, or same line of work. A common misconception is that, you, that th people think that they need to be at their specific job for two years. That is not the case. You can switch lines of work if there's no gaps of employment, but best thing is to have two years of work history. The fewer the gaps, the better. Um, so we're looking at the past two years of work history is what we need for income. Mm -hmm. We need uh, to know the difference between being full-time and part-time at our employment. Um, it will alter the way that we calculate this income. And then if we have more than one job, we need to make sure that we're working both jobs for two full consecutive years in order to count both incomes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if we're self-employed, we're looking at income from the, from, from the perspective of the tax return. So whatever your actual filings say, um, you know, not what your bank statements show, not what you say you made, it's going to be based on what you're reporting to the IRS for self-employed. All right. So let's say we have two homeowners, first time buyers, um, and the total here is about $10,000 a month between the two of you before taxes and deductions. We do not look at what you bring home. We look at your gross rent, or I'm sorry, your gross pay for, for your income. Now, let's go back a little bit talking about this debt to income ratio. If we're looking at $10,000 a month from one family, the two incomes currently carry about $1,500 a month in in debt that that's from their credit report not even talking about the mortgage that they're looking at taking we have 10,000 coming in we got 15,000 a month in auto loans and credit cards and everything like that that sounds like you have a healthy spread there to to take on a mortgage but when we do this DTI calculation we take 50% of what you're being bringing in gross so if, for easy math Let's say you guys are bringing in $10,000 a month before taxes. We cannot go over 50% of that with all of our monthly obligations plus this new potential mortgage. So that 10,000 drops down to five, 5,000. From that 5,000, we need to deduct the 1,500 that you're obligated to pay. Now what's left over is what a bank will say they can, without too much risk, afford a monthly payment of whatever dollar amount is left. In that scenario there, that leaves about $3,500 left for, for a mortgage, which is more than most families are willing to take on. But all that that means is that on paper, you're qualified to go higher, but you know you, you need to speak amongst yourselves and your realtor and your loan officer and decide what, what your preference is. If you don't want to go over 25, but you're qualified to take a $3,500 mortgage, you don't necessarily need to, but just know that you are qualified and congratulations on that because that is one of the hardest things. Yeah. is coming in and speaking to somebody and just anticipating hearing no. Yeah. Nobody likes that rejection, but it's ultimately it's needed. You need to know what goes into it, what we're looking at, and how we come up with the numbers that we do. We don't just choose, you know, offhand. We look at these these the background and uh we we look at caddy and figure out where we're at and what we qualify for. And then it's never a no, really, Mark. It's really just a not right. now. You know, you may not qualify now, but knowing ahead of time, now you could de develop a plan with your loan officer, make a plan to, you know, work on whatever's needed and, you know, have a goal time, like maybe five, six months from now, everything will be ready to go. So mm -hmm. without knowing where you are today, uh, it's going to be hard to figure out what you need to do to qualify for your dream, your next home. So Absolutely. Absolutely. So once a loan officer goes through that, OK, I've explained what a pre-approval process is. Um, I've explained what it is that we look at. Let's say you pass both of these and a plan is not needed. You guys look like you're ready to go now. What's going to end up happening is you're going to get a pre-approval letter. Congratulations is is the intro on this letter. And then there's a breakdown of what your max purchase price is, 
what your max loan amount will be, what type of loan you're going to be taking, the amount of years we're expected to do, which is traditionally a 30-year mortgage. Uh, a lot of the details are going to be on this, this application letter. Now, at least for me, what I like to do is include the home buyers, the the newly pre-approved home buyers that are about to start shopping, start the fun part with Rich. I like to include them on the email as well as a realtor that they're using with that letter attached so that everybody's on the same page. At this point, when you get that letter, uh, like I said, the intro of that letter and the body of the email is going to be all congratulatory because you guys have done everything you needed to do to put yourself in a position that you're now eligible to buy at whatever dollar amount is on that letter. At this point, you are pre-approved and kind of like Rich mentioned about the credit report, you do have a certain amount of time before we have to pull credit because they want to make sure that you didn't get pre-approved and then go run and, and, and do some of these things that I'm about to go over here. So, so at that point, when you're pre-approved, there are some do's, there are some don'ts. These are very, very important. Dues are going to keep that number right where it is on that pre-approval letter. The don'ts are going to either decrease that number or remove you from eligibility altogether. Okay. So very important part here to listen to. When you are pre-approved and you receive that letter, your realtor's on the same page. He's sending you homes. You guys are locking in schedules to go view homes. What you want to continue to do is make all of your monthly payments on time. In that scenario, we had $1,500 worth of monthly obligations. There's no mortgage yet because you're shopping. Make sure that that $1,500 worth of monthly obligations are paid on time every single month while we're shopping. What could happen is a late, which will significantly drop our credit score, which will significantly increase our interest rate, which will significantly decrease the amount of home we're eligible to buy. We don't want that. So pay your bills on time. Two, manage and pay down any excess debt. This is a conversation you're going to have with loan officers. They're going to say, hey, man, your credit score is qualifiable. You are pre-approved for $400,000. We can go up to four twenty-five dollars if and only if we pay down this Discover card that is pretty close to maxed out. Okay, mm -hmm. So if that's something we want to work on while we're shopping at the same time, that's going to help increase your buying power. So that's another do manage and pay down bills if that's part of a plan. Again, everybody is different. Some people may be debt free and I'm and I'm, you know, this does not apply to them. Last do is to contact anybody involved in the transaction with this portion, specifically your loan officer, about any major withdrawals or deposits going into your account. Anything that has to, to do with money in or money out is going to be what's called sourced and seasoned. Mm -hmm. What that means is that any large transactions coming in, deposits in the form of a check, cashier's check, cash coming into your account that you intend on using for your home buy, they're, they're going to question it once we get into contract. We're going to go into that later once escrow is open. That's going to be at a later step, and, and we'll talk more about what I'm what I'm alluding to here. Any Any large amount of funds that are withdrawn could put us in an area where we no longer have the funds for the for for the down payment and closing costs. So again, contact your loan officer. This is something that you need to do. Contact your loan officer for any withdrawal or deposits while you're pre-approved and shopping. Okay. Mm. Couple don'ts, big don'ts. Do not take out new debt. Okay. Do not go apply for a new credit card for 20% off at Target. Do not go refinance your auto loan or trade in your auto loan and increase your monthly auto loan payment. Can I buy a car? Absolutely not. You can buy it <laughs> as a congratulations after you close on your home. But do not go take out new lines of debt, okay? Do not miss any payments because, again, missed payments can mean a derogatory remark on your credit score, which would drop your, your credit score, which drops your or increases your interest rate. We don't want to go down that road. Mm -hmm. Do not co-sign on any new loans for any family members, friends, co-workers, um, you know, it, it's up to your own personal discretion and whether you want to co-sign for anybody at all, but definitely do not do it while you're pre-approved for a mortgage. And the last one, very big one, you would think that this is kind of uh, uh, common sense here, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's worth noting because it does happen. Uh, do not intentionally quit or change jobs. Mm. If we do that, even if it's for the same line of work, what tends to happen is we get into a scenario where we have no pay stub to show what we're making from the new place of business because we just started. And, oh, we don't pay 
until the third week of you being here. Well, we need to close in 30 days. If there's a point where now we can no longer show that we have income coming in, even though you do have work and you are showing up daily, we have we have to deliver something. And again, we'll go through this in escrow. We have to deliver something to our underwriters. And if we're quitting, changing jobs, or our incomes are going up and down, it's going to make it one, very difficult, or two, disqualify us altogether. So mm. don't don't take out new debt. Don't don't miss any payments. Don't co-sign any loans and do not change jobs. A hundred percent. And it's good. And once you're pre-qualified, you know exactly what you're qualified for. You're going to know what, how much your monthly payments are. And it doesn't mean you need to rush out and hurry up and buy a house. That pre-approval letter, guys, once you get pre-approved, you got at least 90 days to go search for a home. Even longer, really. I mean, if mm -hmm. long as nothing's changing your credit, even after the 90 days, uh, if there's nothing changing your credit or your your situation, you, you just get a renewed uh, approval letter. So it's always good in the beginning. So with that said, we're going to go into the first step of the process. Like I mentioned, getting pre-approved by the loan officer. And once you get the golden ticket from Mark, which is the pre-approval letter, mm -hmm. that's when the games begin, guys. And that's when the fun starts and the home shopping starts. And that's where I come in the picture, an agent like myself. Uh, so now that we know uh, based on your pre-approval letter, we got a price uh, qualification point. You know, you may say you're pre-approved to four hundred thousand. Um, so, as an agent, I my job is to listen to what type of house you're looking for, the criteria, how many bedrooms, all that stuff. And I'm my job is to find those properties and email them to you. You know, as you're also probably looking through Zillow and all these other sites and uh, Redfin and things like that. Um, our job is also to assist and help find you those perfect houses that fit your criteria. Uh, once we identify a few, you know, um, me, I like to set up a time, a day of the week that works for everyone. And we'll take that day and go see, you know, the houses that you are interested in just to see if the pictures truly do match up to seeing it on person. Right. Because a lot of times, you know, the pictures will tell one story of a house. It may look beautiful, but. You know, we know that's not the full story. There may be some parts of the home that aren't that are not in the pictures that may not be desirable. So it's always good to go see the home physically in person. And depending on the market, you know, the last three years have been pretty competitive. So um, I tell my clients and buyers, like, if you see something you really love, um, I would say let's be there within the first two days, as, if possible. Um, we really don't want to go past three or four days without seeing it because, even right now, houses are selling pretty fast, you know, and it, um, it can get very competitive. So, you know, within those first few days, we'll go take a look at the houses um, and just see which one is going to really fit fit your needs and uh, and really grab you. And I always know in the, in the past, um, I always tell families this, that you, it's something about it once you find that home. You know, we could see 10 houses, and but then as soon as we see the one that's for you, you usually know pretty quick, you know, you get the feel of the home, uh, you look at the kitchen, you're like, oh, you just you just start seeing images and seeing your furniture, seeing your how you can customize it and design that house and making it yours. That's when you know, and if everything feels good, that's when we discuss making an offer for that house. Now, once we make an offer, there's a few things that I'm, we're going to discuss prior to making the offer. Of course, as an agent, I'm going to connect with the listing agent to get as much information about what other offers they may have for that house. Um, and in, in addition to more details about the house, that's, um, you know, that's not shown online and in the notes. So, you know, there may be some circumstances about the home that's really important and, uh, and we should all be aware. And my job is to relay that to you, to let you know the full story, as far as I know about the property. Um, and then we just simply discuss, you know, the price that we'd like to offer for the house, uh, something that's going to be uh, you know, a good price that gives us a good chance of, of, of winning the bid because a lot of times we're competing with other buyers for the same house. So price is very important. Um, also, too, the time of closing is usually standard 30 days or less. So 30 day close, we can do 45 is if for some situations, if the sellers uh, need more time in the house. So that's another thing. There's times to where the owners still live in a home and they may need another you know, a couple of weeks or a longer escrow. And we just kind of 
accommodate that if we can. So uh, we, we figure out the price, a good price, uh, the closing time. And this is important too, the earnest money deposit. Now, you probably haven't heard of that phrase or that term. It's also called EMD. And basically all that is, guys, the earnest money deposit is just a small portion of your down payment and closing costs. And it's typically about 1% of the offer amount. And what happens is, say we make an offer for 300000 for a house. So we'll just say, you know, we'll put down 3000 for earnest money. Now, that those funds are only to be deposited in at the title company only upon acceptance of the offer. So basically, once your offer is accepted, the 3000 will be deposited in at the title company and what that does it just shows that the buyer is it shows to the seller that the buyer is very serious they're putting up just a small portion of their closing uh um closing funds an up front and those funds will just stay there at the title company until closing day and then those funds funds will be applied to your closing cost basically so that's how it works it it it's not lost. You know, don't think uh, that money is gone. No, it goes towards your down payment and closing costs at the end. But however, again, it just shows how serious the buyer is. Uh, so once we put together those few terms, um, the price and the terms of it, um, I will email you. Um, those are email savvy, uh, you know, and if you're not, we can also accommodate that as well. We can also print out the documents, the the real estate purchase agreement is what it's called. That's the form we'll be completing uh, with your offer on it. Uh, it's called a real estate purchase agreement. And so, uh, like I said, it's, it could be emailed via DocuSign, electronic sign signature, or we can meet and uh, print it out and fill it out in person. Um, but yeah, it's it's more or less 17 pages or more. It's a lot of verbiage in there. Uh, just know that all the verbiage is put there to protect the buyer, the seller, and the agent in all parties. That's the gist of a lot of the verbiage in there. The meat and bones of it, of course, is going to be the offer amount we're going to offer, um, the close, how much time you know we're going to give to close, and the earnest money deposit. Now, guys, um, so that's it. That's pretty much it. Once once we get that, uh, I send it to you the paperwork. Uh, for you to approve and sign off on because we're going to need your signature on that offer amount. And then once I have that, that's when I send that offer, the real estate purchase agreement, along with your pre-approval letter that you got from Mark earlier. I'm going to put those together in an email form and send it off to the listing agent uh, to submit our offer for that home. And uh, at that point, guys, we just sit back, you know, we, uh, we just cross our fingers, pray or whatever, you know, but honestly, I believe really deep in my heart that if it's meant for you, it, it will be meant for you. And if for some reason, you know, they have a higher offer, we just keep looking and find the one that is meant for you. You know, there may be some reason. That's what I believe. So, so I don't want people, I, you know, I, it, sometimes it could be tough, you know, you go for the house you want, but you know, with a lot of negotiations, we try to make the best offer. So you do win that bid and get the home. That's what we're going for. Now, um, no, I guess, you know, once that process is completed, you know, we wait a couple of days, the agent will let me know if the offer is accepted. And, uh, you know, I love the calls when we get and they say, congratulations, Rich, or, you know, your client's offer has been accepted for 123 Main Street. Right. When I hear that, I'm super excited. The very next thing I'm doing is hanging up the phone with that agent and calling you right away. Hey, we won the bid. Congratulations. You know, our offer was accepted. And uh, we're going to open up what is called escrow. Um, and basically, guys, uh, it's, it's good to celebrate then, but we are just getting started now. <laughs> it, you know, after seeing the homes and you finding the home you really love, we made the offer already with the letter. Now, now we're accepted. And now we're going to go into what is called escrow. Escrow is just a period of time, um, <clears throat> the process, the sale of the house. So that's the period of time where a lot of, uh, you know, it's really a lot of investigation, uh, investigative process going on in that part of that 30 days. You know, we're finding out it's all about the home. We're doing inspections. We're, we're, um, we're looking at the preliminary report, just getting all the information about this specific house. Uh, if it's in a uh, if it's in an earthquake zone or if it's in a um, in a flood zone, a fire hazard zone. I mean, we're going to know everything about this house prior to 
um, signing at the dotted line at the end and getting the keys. Now, once we are in escrow with the title company, within the first three days or less, um, that's when typically that earnest money deposit should be sent to the title company. Like I said in the beginning, if we're making an offer for a $300,000 home, a $3,000 check will be you know, either delivered uh, in person. Um, you could just write a check to the title company for the three thousand, and it'll be made out to that title company. Now, if your work, if the escrow is with, say, Chicago Title, you're going to make a check out to sh Chicago Title in the amount of three thousand. Those funds again will be set sitting at Chicago Title. They will cash them at some point, so be sure those funds are available. And again, once at closing. That three thousand will go towards your down payment, and it'll, you know, so you'll 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 bring in a, less than three thousand because you already uh, deposited that. Um, so also, guys, very important: the first seventeen days of every escrow, once you're accepted, the first seventeen days are dedicated for us to do all the inspections of the house. So we're talking, uh, we're going to have a home inspector go out. Um, to the home and do a full home inspection. Um, I have a couple of different home inspectors if you ever need a referral for one, a good one. But yeah, we're going to get a home inspector and a termite inspector there within the first week, week, first week and a half. Uh, because we really need to know what's going on with the house. It looks beautiful, but you know, we don't know everything about it. We're going to, and what they do is they check everything from the roof to the subfloor under the house and everything in between. So everything gets fully uh, inspected very thoroughly, not only by the home inspector, but again, by the termite inspector, okay? Um, so those inspections are buyer's expense. So just keep in mind, uh, if, you know, once you decide to buy a home, um, you're gonna have to, you know, need a little funds as well left over for your home inspection. Now those could range between maybe three to $500 for a full home inspection. Um, and termite inspection, right? Um, but what's going to, it's so worth it, guys, so worth it, because you're going to get a full-blown report. Uh, some of these reports can go 50 pages or so at some times, but we're going to know every single thing wrong with the home um, and the good things about the house, right? So we're going to uncover a lot. Uh, the termite inspector as well, he's going to go out, not only check for termites, termite inspectors are also checking for items that could lead to termites down the road, right? So uh, termite inspectors go under the home, if they notice any leaks, um, if they notice anything funny going on, if the foundation looks a little funny, the termite inspector would even call those out. So, so again, we're getting many eyes on the house to make sure that it's going to be solid and uh, and well kept. Um, also, too, within that very first week of the escrow, we're you know we're excited. The offer is accepted, say a Monday. To, to usually by Tuesday, um, you will probably be on the phone with Mark, the lender or a loan officer. Because really quickly, that first week, uh, the appraisal will be ordered. So that's where your loan officer will come in and they will get that appraiser, appraisal ordered. I want to talk a little yeah. bit about that appraisal. Yeah. And that's a fee as well. So the first week, acceptance, um, earnest money within the first three days. Okay. And those funds you already have because those are, that's your down payment money. Just a portion of it is going to be sitting. And then appraisal will be ordered from, uh, from your lender. Right. Yeah. So when escrow is opened, um, I want you guys to understand that um, you guys are you as the home buyer are going to become the most popular person you've ever been to quite a wide range of people. Uh, your realtor will be reaching out to you. Your loan officer will be reaching out to you. Uh, the inspectors that you have going out there to to view this home that you're looking at purchasing will be reaching out to you. Title companies will be reaching out to you. Uh, everybody is going to be coming at you and it, be, and it can be overwhelming, but just at, try your very best to listen and break down exactly what each party wants and understand that each party is a different arm of this transaction. Mm. So as much and as convenient as it would be for all of us to be on the same page, it just is not the case. Mm -hmm. So if... <clears throat> kind of like what Rich was bringing up the appraisal. That is definitely something that we need on the lending side uh, because the bank wants to know what the value of the home is worth that they're lending money on. Okay. Um, and this goes for anybody that lends any money. You lend money to your family. You're going to want to give them 
20 bucks. But if you know that, you know, they're only good for 10, you're not going to want to give them 20 bucks because you know, you're only going to get 10 back. So an appraisal is going to be ordered, required, you know, by, by the bank in order to learn the condition of the home, the value of the home, and, and whether or not any repairs are going to be requested or needed or anything concerning. Okay. And this is strictly for the financing condition. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is why Rich said that the lender would be taking care of it because we, since we are the financing arm of this transaction, we have our conditions that need to be met. And that is a, an appraisal report by a third party uh, individual that goes out there and evaluates your home and determines its value, determines its condition level, and uh, determines whether or not it qualifies for whatever type of funding we're trying to get. Um, that is, again, on the financing arm. Like I said, you're going to be the most popular person to to quite a few people here. You might confuse the appraisal with the home inspection. That is something completely different. That is your report. The appraisal is my report. Um, you will be, you have access to both of them because you are paying for them. So they are both your report as far as possession, but as far as who they go to, the appraisal report goes to the lender or the bank, whoever you're using. The inspection report is going to go to you and your realtor to determine on your own, okay, your appraiser said it's good, but I have my own concerns because of the home inspector. Mm -hmm. So even if we order an appraisal, which happens as quickly as possible because they are not the quickest to get out there. Um, and when they inspect the home, they also require a little bit of time to write the report up before they get it back to us. So we want to do these things as quickly as possible because, again, like Rich said, we have a time parameter for our due diligence. And we want to make sure that you get all of the information you can within that time frame so you can decide, you know what, this home looked a lot better when we walked through. When we started tearing some of the, the makeup off here, it doesn't quite look like when we first met, you know? So, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. We, we want to make sure we do these things in a timely fashion so that we have all the information available to us to make the decision whether to move forward or to back out of this deal and maybe go and start shopping again. Mm -hmm. So that appraisal is ordered for the lending arm. Again, you, the realtor and the inspector will be something completely different and is not needed on my end. I will not be asking for the report of a home inspection. That is not something that the lending side will do. And, and again, I can't stress this enough because any home, first time home buyer goes through it and, and I talk to them and I always do surveys with them after and they always tell me how overwhelming it is. To, to, to get an email or phone calls from title stating that they need to wire funds or bring in the EMD. And then they get emails and phone calls from me saying, Hey, I need updated pay stubs and we need to order this appraisal. And then they get the home inspector. Hey, when can I schedule? And there's a lot that's going to be coming out. A lot going to be coming to you. Understand that everybody is different and you are the main act in this 30 day, what hopefully is not a circus, but you are the main act and we are yeah. coming to you because you are the decision maker. This is your house, yeah. but just understand that the appraisal is set something separate for the financing arm. And we tried to get that ordered as quick as possible. So you have your information in early enough time to make your decision whether or not to go forward with it. hundred percent, hundred percent. And again, a lot of this, uh, the bulk of this guys, you know, that first week is going to be a little bit kind of crazy, a little bit, a lot busier, mm -hmm. but just know that it does slow down. Mm -hmm. Things start falling in place. Uh, once all, all everything is underway, once the appraiser scheduled the home inspector, all that, then it does slow down. Um, now back to the home inspection report, right? So we had the home inspector go out there. They, they uncovered a lot of things, everything about the home. Uh, the termite inspector went out there. He uncovered everything about the home. Now what we do now, once those inspections are completed, you know, we wait a couple of days, a day or so for the reports to come in. OK, so once we do receive the home inspection report, which you will get a full copy of that as well, mm. and a termite uh, inspection report, uh, we'll get together, whether it's via phone or we meet in person and we just go over the reports. And this is the time where we go over the main concerns, you know, you as a buyer. And me as well, things that I may suggest as well that I would say, hey, this is a concern. We want to we want to ask the seller to um, to fix this or give a credit. So there is. So once we review everything on these reports, guys, we're going to figure out, you know, we're going to make an itemized list and it's and we're going to fill out a form called the Re request for repair. 
So this is the time where we can make a list of things that are very concerning to me and you that we're going to ask the seller to either fix, uh, give a credit for, um, or they can reduce the price based on the findings. You know, so uh, if there's some leaks going on, say there's some roof issues or uh, you know plumbing issues, we can itemize everything on there and then send that in. And now, mind you. The sellers do have options at that point. So this is where it's kind of like a second round of negotiation kind of happens. And, um, you know, a good agent will definitely negotiate everything on your behalf the right way. Um, but, yeah, so this is this is where we send the list in and wait for the for the sellers to let us know how they're going to reply. Um, again, they do have a right to say, you know, pick and choose to do certain things on that list. And then we negotiate to make everyone happy. The objective is that everyone's happy, everyone's satisfied, and we can move forward to the next next process, next stage. Um, but, um, but yeah, so they have an option to either reject it, they can do everything on there and accept it, or yeah, a lot of times um, sellers and buyers agree to a credit, you know, at close. So in lieu of, you know, maybe 10 items that we're, we're calling out, they may, you know, maybe sum them up and say, well, we're going to credit the buyer $7,000 towards their closing cost. Um, now, you as a buyer, we can discuss that. And if that's comfortable to you based on the findings and, and it seems like it's um, it's going to cover a lot of the things, issues you have, we can move forward and accept that. And so what that means at closing, um, the seller is going to contribute the 7000 towards your closing cost, which will be a lot less for you to, to bring to close. Um, so is that something you want to touch on? Or you, you, that's pretty much... Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty the the basis of that the inspections uh, part part of it process of it. Uh, real quick, also two guys within that first seventeen days, we're also we're doing the home inspection, termite inspection. We're also reviewing all the seller disclosures, and what that is is a series of documents that the seller is going to provide you uh, to review, and it's going to be everything they know about the home. What, what, uh, if they've done any painting, if they've done any repairs, if they've ever had any, you know, plumbing, uh, roof leaks, uh, anything about the property to their best knowledge, they're going to provide it to us within the first, uh, typically seven days. Uh, but those whole 17, 17 days, we can review all that. But within the first seven days, they're going to send us what is called a transfer, a real estate transfer disclosure statement and a seller property questionnaire. Those are the two most important forms in the beginning that every seller will provide you as the buyer. Basically, again, telling you everything about the home that to, to their best of knowledge. So just like I had said, if there's any issues or anything wrong with it, modifications to the home, um, just a, a bunch of variety of things. So we'll, we'll have a good idea of what, uh, what's going on with the house initially as well in those first 17 days. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Go on my escrow uh, part. Huh? Want to go on my escrow sure. part? Your what? Escrow part. Go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. Okay. So, right. yeah. So CD, um, the two letters C and D is, is, a. Uh, an acronym for, or just an abbreviation for closing disclosure. Um, anytime that you go into a, um, you know, a mortgage transaction, you're going to get in the very beginning, some initial disclosures separate from the disclosures that the sellers have for, you know, on the realtor side, you're going to get some initial disclosures all regarding your loan and, and um, any, any, you know, lending disclosures that we need to give to you. Mm -hmm. Part of that initial disclosure is going to have a loan estimate. On the loan estimate, it's going to break down the terms and the financing that, that you're looking to to take on this new mortgage. Now, as we get closer to the end and a lot of our those conditions that we were talking about get, get fulfilled and cleared, um, we're going to be given the okay to, to send out what's called a closing disclosure. This closing disclosure is an intent to proceed with closing. The numbers may be the same. The numbers may be a little bit different than the loan estimate, but understand that the closing disclosure does not mean that these numbers are final. What we do need to do is have you acknowledge these the closing disclosures, review these closing disclosures, and sign them. Once we sign them, it starts what's called a cooling off period. That means that no no sooner than three days from when we sign, we're able to close. Doesn't mean we have to, um, but if we don't sign those, we will not start that clock. So 
Every lender is a little bit different. Every file is a little bit different. It's very, very likely for a, a closing disclosure to come out five, six days into an escrow process. Um, you know, but it's also possible that it comes out on day 20, day 21, 22. Um, but just know that when this closing disclosure comes out, that means for the most part, everything has been reviewed by the bank and we're getting pretty close to clearing this thing to close. Um, again, once this comes, you're going to see these numbers. The form is going to look very similar to the initial loan estimate. Um, some of the numbers may be different, but none of these numbers are final. So get with your loan officer. If you need them to go line item by line item and explain what each of these line items mean on this closing disclosure, absolutely do that. They should not be shy or 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 stray away from wanting to do that with you. This is going to have everything that's going to be included in your closing cost broken down on here. Okay. So once this is reviewed and signed, this is your intent to proceed with closing. Um, that's That gets us one step closer. And once we have the clear to close, as long as it's three days past, if you sign a CD on the 14th, you're eligible to close and sign final documents on the 17th. Okay. If we do not sign that, that clock does not start. So uh, once mm -hmm. that comes out, you know you're getting towards the end. But again, don't think that those numbers are final just because it says closing disclosure because things like repair requests happen. And if the sellers are going to give you seven grand, well, then the numbers are going to look a whole lot different on that closing disclosure. So everything is, excuse me, everything is still eligible for adjustment. Um, there's still room for negotiation. Uh, there may be, you know, some fees that are going to be removed or lowered just depending on title. There's a lot that, that can change throughout this process. So none of the, none of these numbers are final until we get the final closing generated package. And that is again, not until we get that clear to close status. So mm -hmm. CD comes out very important for time, time sensitive documents. And it's also important because it indicates that we're getting pretty close to closing this thing up. Nice. Nice. And last, the the finale, the grand finale day, guys, two days, about one or two days prior to the closing day, what we're going to do is go back to the house one last time. Uh, and this is called the final walkthrough. So about two or a day or two before the closing, we're going to get together. We're going to go to the house one last time. And basically all we're looking for right now is just making sure the house is similar condition as it was when we first saw it, you know, as long as there's no new, uh, new holes in the wall or, you know, uh, just completely destroyed. I mean, usually that's not the case, but it's always good to just to double check, uh, you know, like a day before closing, uh, to give that green light just to make sure everything's good to go. Um, so once we're done with that, guys, uh, the rest, we're just sitting back. Um, basically what you're doing from here after the uh, final walkthrough it's just, uh, you know, starting to, you know, pack and hopefully you've already, uh, you know, got your furniture and stuff ready for the home and your plans, how you're going to decorate, because the next thing that's going to happen is just wait for a call from me to give you the great news that we officially closed and uh, we'll schedule a time to meet at the home. And this is the fun part. This is when I get to meet you at the home and come with the balloons and the the champagne and the and the magic and the key, the gold key, key day. Yeah. and hand it over to you and uh, for your new home. So that's pretty much the process. And then that's when the magic and the celebration happens. And just uh, just like make sure you invite me to the the house when you <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring a great bottle of wine. But yeah, guys, that's pretty much it. And then boom, new house. Congratulations, you made it. And uh, and that's it. It's a beautiful thing once that happens. And Absolutely. It, yeah. So. In, one in the closing one, remarks. Yeah, one one last thing too is um it's totally up to you as the home buyer. Majority of these of these uh, processes are handled electronically, so a lot of the stuff uh, like submitting the offer, yeah. uh, getting your inspection report, paying for the appraisal, sure. signing initial disclosures on my end, a lot of that will be electronically. Sure. Uh, as long as you guys are okay with that, it does speed things up. Um, if we wet sign, then the entire process has to be wet signed at least on on my end. Um, so it does speed things up to do things electronically. Sure. Um, however, before we get to that key day, when you're signing the final closing package, that 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 right there, that appointment will be with a notary in person. So you right. will have to be physically in person. If you're out of the state, mm -hmm. you can have a notary somewhere local to your area that you're at. And what they'll have to do is they'll have to overnight 
your signed portion of the documents to title. Um, so that may cause a slight delay there. If you're out of the country, you need to get to a U.S. embassy in order to have a notary there to sign the this. This is a legal, you know, mortgage transaction. So this is a federal. This is a federal transaction. So the final documents will be in person, wet signed with a notary, right. uh, but but majority of it will be electronically signed. Sure. So. And that happens again a couple of days before closing, Correct. two or three days. Uh, you'll meet, yeah, exactly, uh, all the loan documents. And uh, around uh, right around the time we do the final walkthrough, sometimes we do it on the same day. You can sign documents in the morning, and then we do the final walkthrough in the afternoon, make sure everything's good to go. And we sit back for the cl- for the closing. You know what? Another quick another quick thing I always get to at that signing, um, you you go there. Uh, a lot of times I get asked, "Hey, what do I need to bring?" Um, you need your ID, and uh, you need you need you need a pen. That's it, really. <laughs> um, now, at this point, all you've given is in any inspection, appraisal costs, and your EMD. You have not given the full down payment yet. When you go to sign in person, you're going to get instructions for the remaining balance uh, based on whatever title company that we're using here or the sellers choose. Um, they're going to have a couple different ways for you to pay that remaining balance. After you sign, best practice is to go straight to the bank and wire it straight to the bank and get a cashier's check and take it to title. Uh, but that will be the remainder because, again, mm-hmm. the EMD is just a portion right. of what your down payment is. That remaining balance you do not need to take to the signing. You will find out what that is in signing, or you can find out ahead of time from me, uh, from the title company. You can find out ahead of time, but no, nobody at the notary is expecting you to take it there unless you're notarizing it at the title company. Mm-hmm. Then two birds, one stone. Notarize the paperwork, go right across the hall, deliver the check, done deal. You're done. Go about okay. your business and just sit back and wait for that that great call with the congratulations that's it. attached to it. And the woohoo, we did it. <laughs> that's it. That's oh, it. man. Well, that's it, guys. I don't know if you have. A, I, I appreciate you guys joining us and taking time. Hopefully this was super helpful. Uh, we tried to be as detailed as possible. But hey, our phone lines are always open. Social media is always open. You can find us anywhere. Um, we all we love questions. If you got any additional questions, contact Mark, contact me. Uh, we can answer anything else further there, guys. And yeah, absolutely. You can reach me at uh, 559-301-0833 or on Instagram or uh, Instagram is M Rocha home loans. Mm -hmm. Um, and Facebook is uh, Mark Rocha mortgage loan originator. So, well, you might as well get my number 559-721-4313. I'm on social media, real estate, rich Jackson. You can find me everywhere on there. Uh, also, guys, we do a little podcast called The Heat Speakers, so you may want to check out some of those episodes because uh, it's a lot of great content. Absolutely. And uh, in some of those episodes, we also touch on the process, so you might, I'm sure, you'll learn a lot from those. But, um, but thanks for joining us, guys. Hopefully, this was helpful. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, you guys be blessed and go find the new home. We'll be hearing from you soon. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Now, remember, as the buyer, you're going to have a couple different lanes wide open to you with people communicating to you, asking for certain things to be done. Um, He spoke about inspections and you're going to be on the phone with him with disclosures and and things like that with your realtor and and your home inspectors. On the financing side, we did our initial pre-approval, but my ultimate goal is to make sure that you have your funds, your portion of it, and the remaining 95, 96% that we're borrowing from the bank is at title ready to close by the time you guys finish all of your negotiation portions. So in order to do that, we have to go into what's called underwriting. All the documents that I collected from you in the beginning, everything that I ran through and and underwrote on my own stating that, you know what, based on what I see, we can afford this home. What I then have to do is deliver all of those documents in this escrow period to the bank that we intend on using to fund the rest of your deal. Because remember, you're only putting three and a half percent down. The other 96.5% you're borrowing and making monthly payments on. That is what your mortgage is, that, that portion that you're borrowing. Well, in order to get that 96.5%, which is almost the entire cost of the house, 
in order to get that from the bank, they're going to want to make sure that their investment is safe. And by by do, and in order to do that, they're going to want to look at all the same documents that I looked at ahead of time. When I deliver that to that bank, that is us going into underwriting. There's people at that bank that are going to go through the files the same way that I did, and they're going to say, yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Home Buyer, they're good to go. They're good to go. Or they're going to say they're approved with conditions. While you're going through this escrow process with inspections and doing due diligence, you're also going through uh, underwriting with your lender. So we will go into underwriting. The, the plan and what should be happening is that anything that the bank is asking from us in order to secure the funds for this loan, for the most part, we can handle on the back end, some admin stuff, some excuse me, some things we get from the title company. Some Most of it should not be coming from you. But every once in a while, there will be something that comes up. Hey, there was a large deposit on the bank statement. Can you tell me where this is from? Can we source where this $5,000 came from that's in that's on the bank statement? Can you, it says that there's child support that ended in 2020 mm-hmm. on, on the credit report. Can we get the court order that, confirms that it did in fact end and they do not still have a child support payment. There's a lot of things that could potentially pop up solar. If there's solar on the house, there's gonna, they're going to want documents. So sometimes they will say in underwriting, hey, man, uh, Mark, you did a great job. They, they are approved, but there's a couple documents that we need. So approved with conditions. We will reach out to you in a separate email, completely different than the appraiser. I mean, the inspector is completely different than EMD, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm preparing you guys for a ton of different people asking for things because I may need a couple documents to um, prove or document or, or to ensure that what we, what we have in our application is actually accurate. Once all of that is cleared, we're going to get what's called the cleared to close, right? And that is on the financing side. So, it's very, very possible for us on the financing side for you to deliver all of the documents that are requested within one, two, three days. We deliver it to the underwriters. They say, Mark, this is exactly what we needed from your home buyers. You are cleared to close. Where do we send the remainder, this 96.5% of this purchase price? What, what title company do we send it to and let it sit there until everybody is ready to close. Mm. That is what is getting cl- the clear to close on the financing side. And then you would just be taking care of any other portions that maybe haven't been taken care of yet. Um, more often than not, the getting the clear to close will be last. Uh, that, that's something that will come towards the end because there's just a lot more um, underwriting that goes with somebody lending out three, three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars to somebody. They're really going to vet it and make sure that all of the the T's have been crossed and the I's have been dotted. Um, and by they, I mean the people, the bank. The bank is going to make sure that that they've got everything that they need from you um, in order to finance this deal. Mm-hmm. So as you're going through escrow, that is what my my involvement with you will be regarding financing and financing only. Um, there, like I said, there's going to be a lot of people asking you for things, but mm-hmm. just your lender alone is going to be all of the financing issues. Getting that clear to close mm-hmm. means, okay, I can shut down this lane. This guy's no longer going to ask me for anything. Let's focus on, you know, whatever my realtor needs from me, whatever the title company needs from me. Cause like I said, everybody is going to have different requirements, different documents, and they're all doing their same, their own thing, um, to accomplish one goal, but we all have our own separate things that we need. So Mm -hmm. as we're going through escrow, that is when you'll hear from me if we need some additional documentation, some additional proof, uh, you know, or, you know, just an explanation from you. Um, It can be very simple stuff. It it, it may not require a lot or Mm -hmm. some people with uh, what we call, you know, if you, if there's a lot of hair on the loan means that we might have seven, eight, nine different conditions to, to complete. And that's, seven, eight, nine different things that we'll need your help with. So uh, every everybody's situation is a little bit different. And um, that is what we go through escrow on the financing side. And also before I want you to touch on what the CD is issued, but prior, I just want to recap real quick, guys. So just keep in mind, once you're accepted, your offer is accepted, that first 17 days, a lot is going to happen in those days right, right there. Okay. So again, just to recap, your earnest money uh, is going to be deposited. Your appraisal will be ordered. From the with your lender, 
The home inspection will be uh, scheduled. So, and, and just on the home inspection too, guys, just know this, you're more than welcome to go to the home inspection. So if you can, you do not have to be there. So say we, the home inspection is set for Thursday at 2 PM, but you're at work until five, no worries. You don't have to be there. Or if you get off a little early, you can always go for a portion of it or, but you do not have to be there. The home inspector is still going to be there. He's going to do about two or three hours, do a full inspection and, uh, and email you the findings, the, the report within a day or two later, the same with the termite inspector. So again, you're going to have the, the home inspection as well. The termite inspector within those 17 days, we're going to, uh, put together a good list of, you know, items on that home inspection and termite report that you're, you know, we would like the seller to fix or give credit for. Um, at the same time, you're going to be reviewing all the disclosures from the seller. They're going to be sending us all the papers based on their knowledge of the house. So we should, at this point, guys, at, within that 17 days, we should have a great clear picture of the house, what's happening around the, the surroundings of it. Um, and then it, once all those check, check out, you know, we come to a great agreement with the seller on, you know, the repairs requested, they're going to do this, this, and everyone's happy. Um, man, that's, the bulk of it now it's pretty much downhill from there guys uh um the magic word is what we look for is an email from the lender that says clear to close um and also i believe at that time mark that's when uh, the cd is sent out to the buyers to sign correct yeah so cd um the two letters c and d is is a an acronym for or just an abbreviation for closing disclosure um Anytime that you go into a um, you know mortgage transaction, you're going to get in the very beginning some initial disclosures separate from the disclosures that the sellers have for you know on the realtor side. You're going to get some initial disclosures all regarding your loan and and um, any any you know lending disclosures that we need to give to you. Mm -hmm. Part of that initial disclosure is going to have a loan estimate. On the loan estimate, it's going to break down the terms and the financing that, that you're looking to to take on this new mortgage. Now, as we get closer to the end and a lot of our those conditions that we were talking about get get fulfilled and cleared, um, we're going to be given the okay to to send out what's called a closing disclosure. This closing disclosure is an intent to proceed with closing. The numbers may be the same. The numbers may be a little bit different than the loan estimate, but understand that the closing disclosure does not mean that these numbers are final. What we do need to do is have you acknowledge these the closing disclosures, review these closing disclosures, and sign them. Once we sign them, it starts what's called a cooling off period. That means that no no sooner than three days from when we sign, we're able to close. Doesn't mean we have to, um, but if we don't sign those, we will not start that clock. So. Every lender is a little bit different. Every file is a little bit different. It's very, very likely for a, a closing disclosure to come out five, six days into an escrow process. Um, you know, but it's also possible that it comes out on day 20, day 21, 22. Um, but just know that when this closing disclosure comes out, that means for the most part, everything has been reviewed by the bank and we're getting pretty close to clearing this thing to close. Um, again, once this comes, you're going to see these numbers. The form is going to look very similar to the initial loan estimate. Um, some of the numbers may be different, but none of these numbers are final. So get with your loan officer. If you need them to go line item by line item and explain what each of these line items mean on this closing disclosure, absolutely do that. They should not be shy or, or, or stray away from wanting to do that with you. This is going to have everything that's going to be included in your closing cost broken down on here. Okay. So once this is reviewed and signed, this is your intent to proceed with closing. Um, that's that gets us one step closer. And once we have the clear to close, as long as it's three days past, if you sign a CD on the 14th, you're eligible to close and sign final documents on the 17th. Okay. If we do not sign that, that clock does not start. So uh, once mm -hmm. that comes out, you know, you're getting towards the end, but again, don't think that those numbers are final just because it says closing disclosure because things like, repair requests happen. And if the sellers are going to give you seven grand, well, then the numbers are going to look a whole lot different on that closing disclosure. So everything is, excuse me, everything is still 
eligible for adjustment. Um, there's still room for negotiation. Uh, there may be you know, some fees that are going to be removed or lowered just depending on title. There's a lot that, that can change throughout this process. So none of, the, none of these numbers are final until we get the final closing generated package. And that is, again, not until we get that clear to close status. So mm -hmm. CD comes out very important for time time sensitive documents. And it's also important because it indicates that we're getting pretty close to closing this thing up. Nice, nice. And last, the the finale, the grand finale day, guys, two days, about one or two days prior to the closing day, what we're going to do is go back to the house one last time. Uh, and this is called the final walkthrough. So about two or a day or two before the closing, we're going to get together. We're going to go to the house one last time. And basically all we're looking for right now is just making sure the house is similar condition as it was when we first saw it, you know, as long as there's no new, uh, new holes in the wall or, you know, uh, just completely destroyed. I mean, usually that's not the case, but it's always good to just to double check, uh, you know, like a day before closing, uh, to give that green light just to make sure everything's good to go. Um, so once we're done with that guys, uh, the rest, we're just sitting back. Um, basically what you're doing from here after the uh, final walkthrough it's just, uh, you know, starting to, you know, pack and hopefully you've already, uh, you know, got your furniture and stuff ready for the home and your plans to how you're going to decorate because the next thing that's going to happen is just wait for a call from me to give you the great news that we officially closed and uh, we'll schedule a time to meet at the home. And this is the fun part. This is when I get to meet you at the home and come with the balloons and the the champagne and the and the magic and the key, the gold key, key day. Yeah. and hand it over to you and uh, for your new home. So that's pretty much the process. And then that's when the magic and the celebration happens. And just uh, just like make sure you invite me to the the house when we party. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring a great bottle of wine. But yeah, guy, that's pretty much it. And then boom, new house. Congratulations, you made it. And uh, and that's it. It's a beautiful thing once that happens. And Absolutely. It, yeah. So. One, one closing one, remarks. Yeah, one one last thing too is um, it's totally up to you as the home buyer. Majority of these of these uh, processes are handled electronically, so a lot of the stuff uh, like submitting the offer, yeah. uh, getting your inspection report, paying for the appraisal, sure. signing initial disclosures on my end, a lot of that will be electronically. Sure. Uh, as long as you guys are okay with that, it does speed things up. Um, if we wet sign, then the entire process has to be wet signed at least on on my end. Um, so it does speed things up to do things electronically. Sure. Um, however, before we get to that key day, when you're signing the final closing package, that 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 right there, that appointment will be with a notary in person. So you right. will have to be physically in person. If you're out of the state, mm -hmm. you can have a notary somewhere local to your area that you're at. And what they'll have to do is they'll have to overnight your signed portion of the documents to title. Um, so that may cause a mm -hmm. slight delay there. If you're out of the country, you need to get to a U.S. embassy in order to have a notary there to sign the this. This is a legal, you know, mortgage transaction. So this is a federal this is a federal transaction. So the final documents will be in person, wet signed with a notary, right. uh, but but majority of it will be electronically signed. Sure. So. And that happens again a couple of days before closing, Correct. two or three days. Uh, you'll meet, yeah, exactly. Uh, all the loan documents and uh, around uh, right around the time we do the final walkthrough. Sometimes we do it on the same day. You can sign documents in the morning, and then we do the final walkthrough in the afternoon. Make sure everything's good to go, and we sit back for the for the closing. You know what? Another quick another quick thing I always get to at that signing. Um, you you go there. Uh, a lot of times I get asked, "Hey, what do I need to bring?" Um, you need your ID, and uh, you need you need you need a pen. That's it, really. <laughs> um, now, at this point, all you've given is in any inspection, appraisal costs, and your EMD. You have not given the full down payment yet. When you go to sign in person, you're going to get instructions for the remaining balance uh, based on whatever title company that we're using here or the sellers choose. Um, they're going to have a couple different ways for you to pay that remaining balance. After you sign, best practice is to go straight to the bank and wire it straight to the bank and get a cashier's check and take it to title. Uh, but that will be the remainder because, again, mm -hmm. the EMD is just a portion right. of what your down payment is. That remaining balance you do not need to take to the signing. 
You will find out what that is in signing, or you can find out ahead of time from me, uh, from the title company. You can find out ahead of time, but no, nobody at the notary is expecting you to take it there unless you're notarizing it at the title company. Mm -hmm. Then two birds, one stone, notarize the paperwork, go right across the hall, deliver the check, done deal. You're done. Go about okay. your business and just sit back and wait for that that great call with the congratulations that's it. attached to it. And the woohoo, we did it. <laughs> that's it. That's oh it. man. Well, that's it guys. I don't know if you have a, I, I appreciate you guys joining us and taking time. Hopefully this was super helpful. Uh, we tried to be as detailed as possible, but Hey, our phone lines are always open. Social media is always open. You can find us anywhere. Um, we all, we love questions. If you got any additional questions, contact Mark, contact me. Uh, we can answer anything else further there, guys. And yeah, absolutely. You can reach me at uh, 559-301-0833 sure. or on Instagram or uh, Instagram is M Rocha Home Loans. Mm -hmm. um, and Facebook is uh, Mark Rocha Mortgage Loan Originator. So, yeah. Well, you might as well get my number 559-721-4313. Uh, I'm on social media, Real Estate Rich Jackson. You can find me everywhere on there. Uh also, guys, we do a little podcast called The Heat Speakers, so you may want to check out some of those episodes because uh, it's a lot of great content. Absolutely. And uh, in some of those episodes, we also touch on the process, so you might, I'm sure you'll learn a lot from those. But um, but thanks for joining us, guys. Hopefully this was helpful. Yeah. Hopefully. Uh, you guys be blessed and go find the new home. We'll be hearing from you soon.